Braun later. So, hey, there you go. <laughs> Welcome to The Jump. I'm Rachel Nichols alongside The Jump's resident head coach and a man with two rings, Mr. David Fisdale, and the host of the Hoop Collective podcast, New York Times bestseller from the Cobra Dome. Brian Windhorst. Coming up, the Warriors <laughs> finding a way to win despite a freezing cold night from Steph. Is that something, nothing, or everything? We will play one of our favorite games. First, though, how much bad stuff can you live with to still get some of the good? That has been the question facing not just sports leagues, but every person, every family, and yes, every business in this country since this whole global pandemic started. Is it really worth it to take that trip out to the grocery store? Most people think yes. What about to go to work? Well, your answer probably changes depending on how much you need that job to make rent. Or, or what about letting your kid play with a neighbor? What if then the neighbor tests positive for COVID and either you get it too, or even if you don't, you're told that you and your spouse and your kids need to spend a week without leaving your house, just to be sure you're not spreading it. Will that play date have felt worth it? Right now, the NBA is still answering that question with Yes, even as the number of affected teams and players mount. Just this afternoon, the league announced that both tonight's Pelicans-Mavericks game and Tuesday's Celtics-Bulls game were being postponed due to COVID issues, the third and fourth such postponements of this three-week-old NBA season. And the number of players across the league who are in COVID-related protocols is mushrooming. 11 on Wednesday, 15 on Thursday, now it jumps to 26 on Friday, 27 on Sunday. We're still getting the full count from today. Here's Brad Stevens walking off the court yesterday after the Celtics Heat game had to be postponed. That game was called due to COVID issues on the Miami side. But I'm guessing the postponement was actually a relief to the Celtics, who as of yesterday only had eight players available themselves. Now that would have actually technically have been enough. NBA rules this season say if you got eight, you have to take the court and play. Because frankly, they need to get games in, and eight is where they've drawn the line on the bare minimum to make that possible. But of course, that is not sitting well with everyone. Take what happened Saturday with the Sixers. After COVID and its accompanying precautions ripped through the Philadelphia locker room, Doc Rivers said he didn't think the team should be playing. That going ahead with only eight or nine guys would cause too much wear and tear on the players who were on the court, including stars like Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. Now, the league disagreed. So the Sixers ended up holding Embiid and Simmons out of that day's game against Denver anyway, listing them with minor injuries, bringing their number of healthy bodies to seven. Maybe they were hoping that would trigger a postponement, but it didn't since neither the injuries to Simmons nor Embiid had previously been reported to the league. And look, I don't know the exact conversation between the team and league officials, but to outside eyes, the message from the NBA sure seemed to be, hey, we know no team wants to only play games that count in the standings with a severely undermanned team, but you can't just force a postponement by sitting a couple extra players to get under that eight benchmark. It's a message the NBA further amplified this afternoon when it fined Philadelphia 25 grand in relations to Simmons sitting. And if you think all of this has caused some rankling in team front offices, you would be correct. Our Adrian Wojnarowski reports that one general manager told ESPN, quote, they tell us it will be better later in this season, but I just hope this doesn't break the league in the next few weeks. Now, Woj also reports there is now a special board of governors meeting happening tomorrow and that the league's GMs are scheduled to have a conference call today to go over whether protocols should be further tightened. For example, right now on road trips, players are allowed to have a guest or two from that city visit their hotel room. It's supposed to be a family member or close friend. I don't know how much longer that's going to be allowed. There's also new scrutiny on players from opposing teams hugging or talking without masks after a game. Still, bottom line, at least right now, the NBA is expected to tell teams the league is moving forward, even if the competitive balance is a mess, even if the stop-start nature of the protocols leaves some players more vulnerable to injury. After all, this isn't just a play date. This is an eight to $10 billion a year business. The effects of just shutting down until players are vaccinated would be catastrophic to that business, both short and long term. When those diving for their fainting couches today say, this is about the money. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is about the money.
Pro sports have always been about the money, and you are perfectly within your rights to be disgusted with that if you choose. But it's also the reason the NFL, Major League Baseball, college football played through postponements and positive tests. It's just that the degree of difficulty was always going to be harder for the NBA, which plays several games a week indoors with fewer bodies available per team in what now is the absolute worst spike of this virus. So should the NBA go back to a bubble? Good luck convincing players to be locked away from their families for the next eight months. Should the league expand rosters? Seems like it. Should the guidance change on how teams hold in-person meetings and practices or whether they hold them at all? Maybe. For those who made fun of Allen Iverson about practice all those years ago, the Cleveland Browns would like a word. (laughs) The hard reality is that all NBA teams, all they have faced so far in this short season, it is going to continue, probably getting worse before it gets better as long as the league plays basketball in a pandemic. Is it worth it? So far, the league and its players say yes. So Brian, what should the NBA do now? So they're gonna have to adopt some changes, Rachel, because while there definitely are positive tests happening, we know of a lot of them, uh, what's really causing games to be postponed is the contact tracing. When one player gets a confirmed test and then all of a sudden they have to put six or seven players into a contact tracing protocol. So the idea here would be to to amend some of the day-to-day procedures so that you won't have to put as many players in contact tracing. Keep them farther apart, put some more measures in it, maybe not have contact tracing be so long so that you wouldn't have a devastating effect on a team. But there's another message that's going to have to get through. Rachel, there are hundreds of players in this league who have had COVID over the last nine or 10 months. Uh, There are certain teams that have had double digits. I've heard at least one team thinks its entire roster uh, has the antibodies. But um, that does not necessarily mean, as we saw with Kevin Durant, who has admitted he had COVID in the past, that you can't uh, be put into contact tracing. And so players may be instructed to change their behavior off the court, away from team facilities, even if they are operating under the belief that they have some protection with COVID, and that's going to be a hard sell as well. Yeah, I mean, this is difficult. This is a this is a difficult circumstance. While COVID is is peaking at its highest moments right now, I do think that they're going to have to put more protocols in place to try to protect these guys. But at the end of the day, I think people are just going to get it. Um, you know, it's just inevitable. Uh, it's too many different layers to it to where people have contact and can possibly, you know, contract it. And so I think teams are going to have to keep, you know, really being strict with their players. Players have to be pros about this to make sure that everyone's staying healthy in the building. And and ultimately, we're going to see postponed games. That's just going to be part of the deal. But I do think they're going to keep moving forward. And eventually, maybe by the time we get to the playoffs, you may see another bubble then. And now we get everybody in the building like we did in Disney last year, which went off amazing. Uh, but I think they got to get to that point. And look, if you want to be high in the standings, if this is important to you to go after this championship, then you have to make sacrifices about where you go and who you interact with. And if teams aren't taking care of business and their whole team is getting COVID, then somebody or multiple people on that team is not really serious about what they're doing and not being professional. So I do think the league has to be very strict about this and they have to get a hold on this so that we can move forward with a successful season. And it's an important distinction, right? Look, people who test positive for COVID haven't necessarily done anything wrong. There are so many people I know who have tried to do everything the right way, and, and this virus creeps in. That but. is how this works. <laughs> but. but there is also a matter of, hey, you can try to mitigate your risk. And your point about yeah. having to sacrifice goes to exactly to what Brian was just saying, the idea that in players' personal lives especially, Do you? And I'm not talking about crazy stuff. I'm not talking about wildly irresponsible stuff. I'm talking about the same stuff the rest of us are all grappling with. Hey, we haven't had a barbecue in six months. Can we finally have one? It's outside. Hey, my kid really is desperate for just some human contact. They want to play with their friends. These are things that all Americans are dealing with every day as this spike in coronavirus cases. I can't even call it a spike anymore. Just the way cases continue to mushroom in this country are dealing with. And the level of sacrifices that play may be asked to make from here on out to mitigate some of the contact tracing issues that Brian is talking about. Kevin Durant, the example he gave, a friend or family member having a positive test is what caused him to sit 
right, for those days, even though he already had COVID, even though he did test to still have antibodies now. We don't know enough to have him just mix with the rest of the team, so he had to sit. And it's going to be harder and harder for players to just live their daily lives. And to your point, Fizz, they have to decide, is it worth it? It's what I started the show with. Right. Is it worth it? We are all having to decide over and over again every day with every interaction we have, is it worth it? And it, of course, extends to what Doc Rivers was upset about. Yes. In that Philly game Saturday against the Nuggets, the seven players who played, three played more than 40 minutes, including rookie Tyrese Maxey, who scored 39. Ooh. Doc explained before the game his concern about any of his players playing that much. Take a listen. I'm more concerned with health on the floor. You know, we're going to play players tonight that haven't played a lot of minutes. You know, um, I'm not going to, you know, so like when you got seven bodies, this someone's going to have to play 40 plus minutes. And so, and that's not just for today, that's long-term health, you know, with the accumulation of games, you know, it's the, the numbers we want to stay away from with our players. All right. So Fizz, you know, Doc's pain, you've had to manage minutes in your time Absolutely. as a head coach. What would your concerns be when faced with the same situation as Doc? He's hitting it on the head. I mean, the one thing I think all of us coaches have become over the last few years is like sports scientists, right. like, we're like unofficially. Right. So we have learned that there is a science to the fact that if a guy is playing so many minutes, say five minutes a game, low minute guy, and all of a sudden he jumps up to 40 minutes a night playing competitive NBA basketball against the best players in the world that could lead to injury, especially over cumulative nights. And so he's right. And so again, the league is gonna have to figure out how do we work this so that one, we're protecting our players from COVID, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we're protecting our players on the court from getting serious injuries, you know, pulls, you know, uh, twists, things like that, that can have you out for a whole year, for six months, things like that. And so, yes, Doc is right. When you're a coach, you're trying to manage all of this. And when you got seven guys, you really don't have a choice. Most of those guys are going to play close to 40 plus minutes. And that's just the situation that you're yeah, in. When they, came, when they came up with this eight player rule, mm -hmm. it wasn't in the COVID era. And maybe, maybe <laughs> it would happen one time or two times a year in the entire NBA. And maybe it would just happen for one night because a guy or two had a, had a twisted ankle or, or, or was under the weather for one day. This, this rule, this eight player rule was not built for contact tracing that lasts seven days. And so there's really only two options. You're either gonna have to reevaluate the contact tracing rules as a result of new protocol, or they're gonna have to consider expanding the rosters, which they've already done a little bit of by allowing 10-day uh, contracts, which they don't usually allow at this point in the season. Uh, we've seen a couple of teams sign hardship players. Before this uh, season started, Rachel, the NBA kicked around ex extending the amount of two-way players from two per team to four per team, or even you know, negotiate to three. They ended up not doing that. They may have to relook at that to yes. see, to give a little bit of more of a buffer. Yeah, and, and look, that's complicated too, right, Brian? Because I, I was I was listening to the Hoop Collective podcast on the way into work today. <laughs> it's excellent. I recommend it to everyone. And you and ben, uh, Tim Bontemps and Royce Young were discussing a team like Boston had 14 players available when they went to bed and eight players available when they wake up the next day because of contact tracing concerns. And so you couldn't get... Even if you had those expanded rosters, right, could you get the guys you would need in the right place at the right time for the game? Well, you might be able to, but you can't just sign the guy off the street. Like in the past, we've seen guys sign at 10 a.m. and start at 7.30. Now a player would have to go through a quarantine. You can't just sign them. So even getting a new player takes days. So you would ideally like to have those players healthy. Uh, but again, if they're ensnared in contract tracing, you're in the same, you're in the same boat. You know, the Major League Baseball had this sort of taxi squad where they had like guys located down the road sort of playing simulated games and that helped them grease the skids. I don't know if the NBA could look at something like that, but the G League is headed towards a bubble and even that has issues because even if you plucked players out of the bubble who are playing well and healthy and, ready and, and in shape, they would have to quarantine because they'd have to travel from Orlando to join the team wherever they are. This is just really complicated. The league is going day by day. Yep, and of course, if you do expand the rosters and those guys are in your traveling party, it means that you might be more open to contact tracing issues because that's one more guy who might be bringing COVID into the group. It is complicated. All right, coming up, we're going to talk actual basketball. Imagine that. Terry Rozier's <laughs> impressive move-dunk combo sparked a list 
of some of the best move dunk combos in NBA history. You know, Professor Bodmer's been in his laboratory. First, though, time for our distant replay. This date, 2001. Hello, old Not friend Tracy McGrady. Court, here's Armstrong, open court. T-Mac, baby. Oh. Through the air for the jam. oh, that was a fair. <laughs> Boy, that was a nice one, wasn't it? Get off the Seven. floor.